Hey everyone, welcome back to the table. I'm Scott and this is going to be table talk. What is table talk? Table talk is we're going to talk about whatever we're working on at the time. So what are we doing today? Today we have some 3D prints. I got a whole bunch of prints that I need to clean up, get together and just um, assemble me either for orders, personal projects, upcoming videos, whatever. I don't know. There's there's a whole bunch of crap here. And I, I just thought there's some good points to just talk about with this whole thing. Some problems that I experienced while, you know, 3D printing this stuff. And um, we don't get a tremendous amount of orders. We get a decent amount, you know, a couple a week type of thing. And, you know, sometimes when you get 3D prints for things, you want to trust the supports that they give you, right? Um, they'll have stuff that's pre-supported and they'll have professionals do it or whatever the deal is and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't work i it is what it is right and it, by now we've been printing i don't know probably like three four five years something like that and you can kind of recognize when something's going to work and something doesn't and you know your gut just tells you hey i need to I need to probably put my own supports on that or support the supports or add some extra or whatever I need to do. And you don't listen to your gut and then later on you regret it. And it really kind of sucks. So what am I talking about? Um, so here's a good one. I'm doing this Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle or um, 3D print. And it's it's really cool print because it's got, if you know anything about Ninja Turtles, you know, you got the four Ninja Turtles. You got Raphael, Michael, Leonardo, and Donatello. And they are have this really cool scene, um, and I'll put a link down below so you can see this. And if you want to grab the print yourself or whatever, uh, but they had this really cool scene, and it is done like in one. Um, they have like the the STLs are are prepared in size to be in one fourth size, which is huge, and then they have um, a one twelfth size, and this is the range. And you can obviously resize it however you want to, but they meant to make this thing like absolutely freaking massive, right? So I have a one ninth scale printing of this done um, right now. I'll probably rant and rave about that scaling a little bit later on, but um, it's got some really cool features. So you could see something here where it has the this neat thing. You know, the turtles are going to stand on top of it uh, like this. So in this particular case, you got Leo who's going to be um, chilling here. You can kind of you get the idea and the scale of this thing. Right, if you put his, you get his arm. I must have left his arm over there, or I don't even know what I did with it. Where'd your arm go, Leo? Where did your arm go, buddy? Okay, well, apparently we're missing it or something. We'll figure that out later. But anyways, the idea is that you know it's gonna be probably about that tall with his you know arm up there. Pretty big. Um. So the thing about this particular print is usually the bigger the prints are, like the thicker you need the supports, right? Because when you're printing this thing, you're essentially printing it upside down. So like imagine the plate is like like this, right? And it's going like this up and down and, and slowly printing this thing from top to bottom. And you usually you don't want your prints to like be completely flat when you do that because you kind of create like suction and then it... It's going to rip off the print plate. Some people are crazy and they do it in certain ways, but I always like to kind of put mine in a little bit of an angle, usually like between 20 and 30 degrees from whatever straight up is. And there's other reasons for that that I can't think of or not going to go into whatever excuse I want to use. But um, the thing about this, though, is the supports were really, there's a lot of them. There's like a million supports, but they're all really, 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 really thin. And so the problem is those those like um, supports were flexing. They're kind of flexing if they're going into the bath and they kind of like flex a little bit. And so you don't get a ton of warpage, but you get a little tiny bit of warpage. And it really sucks because what, what ended up happening in this particular one, and this is my debate right now, do I fix the supports and reprint the, the these? Um... Or do I fill it and then, you know, make it look nicer? It's it's always a debate and you just never know. And if it's for an order, you want it to look its best. But at the same time, 
every time you reprint, it's less it's less you make off of it, right? And in a case like this, because the thing's so big, you know, you're a little mess up on a print is a big deal. <laughs> so, um, but anyways, what our problem is, is if I'm putting this completely flat right now and you can see, you can see the gap, right? So that's the part that sucks is, you know, even, even if I, cause you got a bow in the center, so it's going to wiggle like that. You can see how it goes. But then, even if I were to line it up in the back, you get still a little bit of a gap. You can see it there. And part of it's part of it's meant to be there because they cleverly did the wall details. Let me put this a little bit closer so you can see what I'm talking about. See how they did the wall details in the gap in the middle? They meant it to look like that. So that way it had some continuity between it and you could you wouldn't have to be compelled to to fill the gap but the problem is that it's done it so much that it doesn't quite work so that means i need to probably do some filling or make it happen um i might be able to just put and like sand out this little bit of a bow in the middle and it'll go closer maybe i don't know i was thinking about printing one of these for myself so what i might do is just kind of fill it around with this one and then put new supports on the new one but Either way, I guess my advice for the day is you got to look at the supports. Don't always trust the supports. They might say they're professionally done, but even if they are professionally done, different printers have different things and it could vary a little bit. So just use your own judgment when you're 3D printing. That would be my tip of the day, if you will. And use your own judgment when you're printing. Use your own um supports as you need to you can always add supports to somebody else's you don't have to just blanket use the give everything a support you can add little supports in places you think are needed um so it kind of depends on what you want to do but i would say my rule is you probably don't want to have a million little tiny um supports all over this thing now this is kind of interesting because the the printer um that did this particular one he or they, uh, there's a couple, there's a, a group of them that are doing this particular print. They test printed these things out. Like they test print everything that they publish. In fact, they don't actually release the files until they have done a test print. And they, they, they say, hey, it's done modeling. And they show a picture. And then they go, hey, it's done um, rendering. So they show you what it looks like in color or, you know, in whatever environment. And then they do, hey, we've done a test print. And then that is the moment that they actually will release it. Like shortly after that, they'll release it to everybody. Now, this one I think is an older print, so they probably didn't do that to it. But I absolutely love that process. Like I, I want to just stay part of a subscription to that particular group just because they do that. And plus their sculpts are really, really cool. And I'd like to just print everything that they've done. <laughs> but um it, I really like that they do that process because there's a lot of times that, um, I don't know, we probably have two or three terabytes worth of uh, 3D prints. Everything that we've ever got on a subscription or purchased or whatever, I've downloaded and stripped away, you know, the, the junk, if you will, the extra files and, and whatnot. And so a couple terabytes worth of STLs is quite a few. And I'm a pack rat, storage is cheap. We got a bazillion. So I've seen and subscribed to a ton of different ones. And I would say I like this methodology the best out of all of them because there are ones that are out there that they make them, they do them, they'll, they'll do the modeling, and then they'll just kind of throw it on there, say supports, yep, good. And then I can guarantee they probably never print that model. They Especially ones that might have been doing it for a while and they just like really get a kick out of like you know, just making because they want to make their art come to life, which I get, I really get that. I think it would be really neat to do that sort of thing. But one of the things I really like about this group, like I said, is they actually go through and test it. Not only that, but they show you proof of them testing it, which is really cool. So um, I think um, them showing a picture of it printed versus showing a rendering of it, because you can definitely tell the difference is pretty good um, indicator what kind of quality control they go to. So um, 
I guess you could say the same thing about us because we have some things that we have um, printed. I guess I'm going to put the Ninja Turtle aside here for a minute. I'll go on another, show you on another adventure. So we have, you know, an online store. We sell prints and do different things. And one of the ones that we just set up is uh, with a group called Black Forge Games. And I really like um, their sculpts. Their sculpts are really cool. And I don't come out a ton of them every month. They usually have like a couple of really cool ones every month. And I'd rather, if I hit the pick, I'd rather them do some, a couple of really cool ones than a bunch of little tiny ones that just don't end up, you know, whatever. But these particular ones, they have these really neat sculpts that they did. And I have them on my store, but I have not, well, I have them all printed now, but I put them on the store before I actually printed them myself because you know, time, whatever. Um, so I actually 3D printed one of every single thing that I have with them that I'm authorized to sell. And so I guess I can't really complain too much about quality control. I guess where I'm going at if I'm not actually doing it too. But that's why we're uh, practicing what we preach and that's why I printed one of everything. So this one here um, is a really cool sculpt. I really like this one. Uh, into Viking stuff for sure. I'm just gonna just kind of putting it together here. Gives you a cool idea of what this one's gonna look like. And I'm just gonna kind of show you what it looks like. Sorry, dude, you lost your arm. We're just gonna put bear with me here a second. Dude, your your leg is whack. You go to a doctor or something. There we go. They do a really good job of keying the the this Black Forge games. They do a really good job of keying the models and making sure that even if you don't know how the thing goes together, it's really simple. I know there's not a lot of pieces, so maybe you're like, whatever, that's cool. But I could literally take the pieces from this mix them together and try to try to like us like with the two or three other prints try to mix them together and i wouldn't be able to assemble them all of the things are set up in a way they just wouldn't fit together i don't know if that's intentional accidental or the pieces just look different enough together but the way they key them together is always different even within itself so you got two different arms here and the sizes for the pegs that these go into are completely different so i can't accidentally put this on the wrong arm now it's kind of obvious which arm goes to which because of the thumb placement and hand placement and all that other stuff but you know whatever um but it is kind of unique to each of them so let's i think this will work good enough i'm going to give you So this is where I just need to clean it up and glue it together because that's what I want to do with it. Um, in fact, actually, we're going to do that. I'll show you what the model looks like in a second. The fully completed model because this is one that I've pre-sanded a little bit, the, the main pieces, and I just need to do a little bit of slicing and dicing with the knife. So this is a good example of what this model looks like. Pretty neat. It's at a 1 12th scale. Um, and so we're going to go through, pull up my notes here. So we're going to go through and uh, just, I'm just going to clean this one up and then we'll glue it together. But I have a couple of them. So um, I got this one here. I just showed you there is, along with all the Ninja Turtles and stuff, I got this one here that is a really cool model. Um, I did 3D print a whole bunch of these actually for... The Nova Open, there is a, a charity called uh, Mental Health Charity Painters, and I did a huge print for them. I did about 200, I think it was about 250, 220, somewhere around in there, that range of um, the small version of these, like a 32 millimeter size of the Hugen model, which is a really, really cool model. I'm going to put this one together too in a minute, but it's really, it's got like this cool base that has... So 
pretty cool base. It has flames coming up around it. I put a bunch of these together so you can kind of tell. I don't even have to think about where the pieces go. But it's got some really cool flames. You can paint them up. You can actually 3D print these, print this clear. And then you can, there's actually holes inside the back of this, inside the inside, inside the inside. I don't know if that's a word or not. But you put that in there and then you can actually wire the whole thing up so that way you can have it like light up and look really cool. Um, I didn't do that with this. I didn't really feel like doing lighting. I just wanted to print the model and paint it, make it look cool. So, um, but we have that, and then he goes together. Let's show you how it looks really quick, and then get back to this. It's had somewhere in there, but we'll find it in a minute. There we go. This is another one that looks really cool. So you got this huge statue. Uh, we've got actually a couple orders for these that have gone out and I've taken pictures. Um, the shield just looks awesome. So cool picture, cool uh, model here. So again, I'm cleaning this up. I'm gonna have that ready for myself to do. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to my other camera just so you can see what I'm doing here. So should get a top-down view of everything I got going on. You can actually see, um, this is actually Casey Jones. I keep getting myself distracted. This is actually Casey Jones. It's still on the, the sprue. This just came off the printer a couple hours ago. Um, but I need, to, I need to basically pull the supports off of this one. This is one that I did the supports with. Um, I printed this one, or I did this one after I already started printing uh, Leo. So I'm like, I'm gonna put my own supports on here. But you can see that these supports are a little bit, th are thicker. Um, I know it's probably hard to tell. These supports are a little bit thicker um, compared to the supports that were on um, the Ninja Turtles. And so here's a good idea. It shows you how thin these supports are. Let me just peel these off. I just got lazy and pulled the bulk, bulk of them off. But you can see the difference you can see the difference between these supports and that supports. Now, what are the benefits of the thicker supports? The thicker supports are going to bend less. So when I put pressure on them, it's going to be harder for these to bend, um, you know, the more the model is and, and everything. And these ones are going to bend easier, but when you take them off, they're going to have less impact into the actual, um, into the actual model itself. It's going to have less impact to the model itself. It's not going to um, create like potholes that you have to fill or or you got to be extra careful to make sure you don't dig into the model and do stuff to it. So this is kind of a neat thing that you got to think about and consider when you're printing your stuff, depending on how you want to finish it. I would say it's, I spend more time finishing it. It feels like I spend more time finishing it than I do painting it, but you know, whatever. Um. All right, let's go ahead and start cleaning this. But one of the things that kind of that drives me nuts about um, any 3D print is that there seems to be a lack of understanding of what scale means. Um, you know, people like to throw around, you know, uh, heroic scale and and uh, tabletop scale, or they'll say, oh, it's you know, 32 millimeters. It's like, do you know what that means? And and I'm not professing that I have an expert opinion or an expert, you know, look on exactly what the scale is, but following just kind of the general guidelines and rules of it, um, you know, what scale really means is like how, how big a particular model is compared to the real life size of it, right? Um, so if something is one foot tall, if it's one foot tall in, you know, real life, then you and you were to go in and shrink it down to, you know, one quarter inch scale, then or one quarter scale, then it's going to be a quarter of that foot, right? A quarter of that foot, which is three inches. So if you were to take that foot 
right? This is you got a foot in real life, and then you shrink it down to a quarter inch size, and now it's going to be three inches tall. So when you actually 3D print the model, it should be three inches tall. And from there, it's just math. It's just math from there. And what happens is that with like 32 millimeter scale, um, 38 millimeter scale, 28 millimeter scale, um, they'll call it Dungeons and Dragons scale. You know, there's all sorts of different com things. You'll get something where everybody interprets it slightly different because they don't know what it really means. They just kind of, it's like a buzzword that people use. And so, and that's fine. But what it is, is you need to check things for yourself, right? So if you're trying to, if you're printing stuff from the same person all the time and you're just accepting whatever scale that they put it in, that's perfectly fine. Because more than likely, their stuff's going to be consistent across the board. I say more than likely because I've ran into the instances where it's not. Their stuff's going to be consistent across the board. And why that why that matters is you know you can re you can rescale something you can make something bigger you can make something smaller no big deal but if you go in and you make something dramatically bigger or dramatically smaller if they are holding something like a weapon or whatever then all of a sudden you got this sword that's comically thick or large compared to another model that you have on the table that might be holding a very similar sword that looks really small or looks really hu huge, right? And so then it just starts getting weird. So even though the height might be correct, the, the size of the weapon could be a little bit off too. Now, most of the time, the like almost all the time, very rarely have I seen this not done, the person that is 3D or the, the person that's making the STL is actually telling you what size that they're doing. So you so generally you can go off of that and then you can say, well if I wanna if I wanna take it from a um two uh, uh, twenty eight millimeter scale and I want to bump it up to a seventy five millimeter scale, then I'm going to um I'm gonna take and I think the the Math is failing me, so I'm just going to tell you a wrong number, but it's like 224% or 227% or something like that, right? You're going to go, you're, or 237%, I don't know, whatever. If you do the math, you get the right answer. Um, and actually, you know, quick side trip. I made a um, nice little chart. I'll put a link to it down below in the, in the comments, but I made a cool little chart that actually can you can convert the scale from one to another and it tells you what percentage you need to scale the, like change the model to to fit that scale um so you can use the cheat sheet down there that's why i'm being dumb right now because i don't have that in front of me um it's at my workstation that i do all my slicing but you can convert things to the scale and it works and you can be consistent with it and and make it work and a really good example is actually the teenage the the teenage mutant ninja turtle um thing that I'm doing is actually um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle thing that I'm doing is actually in a ninth, one ninth scale. I'm sorry. Yeah, one ninth scale. But the Casey Jones model is from a different one and it is a one um, that one is a one tenth scale. So it's like, well, I don't want Casey Jones to look stupid or like like a baby compared to the rest of them so i need to convert that over and shrink the model whatever to a different size than whatever the default is that the creator did so um so kind of another tip since i'm thinking about it and this is one of the other reasons i did my own supports on the casey jones stuff is for when if they if it, the model comes pre-supported you really can't change the scaling of the supports right you don't want to take the supports and and scale them with the model because they more than likely won't work i'm not saying they won't i've tried that before i've tried it a couple times before they both really kind of ended in a disaster and most of the prints worked but i had to reprint um, I had to reprint some of them. 
some of the pieces and it ended up unfortunately it was for an order and it ended up costing me money to make the print because I had to like reprint the pieces a couple times because I was being a bonehead um which really sucked this is a long time ago when I was kind of just starting so good tip reapply the supports do an unsupported model um an unsupported model and then position it and then you can scale it the way you need to and if you're not sure what positioning they do most of the time they are really like the people providing stls are really good about positioning the 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 model in the right way to provide support it's kind of like a really good way to um like kind of prevent the most things so like a good example here is this particular print when you printed it it was like it was like this it was like imagine this is the the plate here right it was like this because what they want to do is put most of the supports on this edge that isn't like the visible surface around like the boot and all that and it didn't look um, it didn't look terrible. It didn't, you're not going to get like little pieces because as much as you don't want, you want to try to avoid or you try to avoid it, you're likely going to get some type of little tiny markings on um, a model and you just don't want that. It makes the model looks, you know, stupid and, and unfinished and not very professional. And, but if you don't care about those things and whatever, you know, you do you, but um, I just really noticed that a lot of times with these with these um, with these prints, they'll try to put them in a way where it's supported, where the joints are going to go, or something like that. So that way, you keep the model looking as nice as possible. So if you're unsure how to position it, because sometimes, like say the you'll get it and the model is flat, like it's flat um, for the unsupported version, but for the supported version, it's all sitting up the right way. Well, you can put both of those on your in your slicer program and then position the piece the same way as the support is and then delete the one that is already has the pre-supported on it and then you can support your own because it's already in a position um, most of the time that works like there's very few times that i actually have to adjust it otherwise um so but that's one of the things that black forge games does really good is they have fantastic support placement so you're not just you know, printing all over the the nice surface that's textured or whatever the case might be. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good tip for that one. Um, I figured that one out uh, about a year or so ago, and it is very, very, very helpful. Um, if, I, if I'm debating, you know, do I use pre-supports or not pre-supports? But, you know, just check for yourself. Really, honestly, you should probably do that everywhere in your life and not just be um do that everywhere in your life don't just walk jump off the bridge like everybody else is doing you know maybe you heard your parents saying that like everybody jumps off a bridge are you gonna jump off like well, maybe if it's what i want to do but not because they're doing it <laughs> you know so but they um yeah, make up your own mind. Look and check out what is happening with that and, and just do it. Now, I haven't cured this yet. I have not put this under light and cured it. This is off. I printed this a couple days ago. You, I like doing this before I cure it because I want to get, I want the it to be soft. It's a little bit more forgiving when it's soft. Uh, makes it a little bit easier to trim and clean up and do what I need to do to it. And it's a little more forgiving that way. Also, if for some reason I make a huge mistake, say like all of a sudden uh, my knife slipped and I did a big gouge in it, I can actually take a couple drops of um, of the resin that I used and I can I got a little tiny dropper and I can drop it in that spot and then I can cure it and then I can re-trim it and or sand it depending on what's going on. Now usually I save that for like really big issues um, big holes, big problems. Um, I try not to to do that all the time because it just if it's that big of a thing where I need to use a dropper, then I probably should just reprint it. Um, but sometimes I do need to do that just because it's the way it is. So 
All right, I think I got everything sand or trimmed up here. And I'm just using a hobby knife, uh, standard hobby knife you get this at any store. Now for something like the bottom of this base that's going on here, I'm gonna take this out to the garage. I'm going to um, put my mask on. I'll put my mask on and I'll actually do, a, I'll take a sander. I have like an orbital sander. I got a battery powered one and I have a, um, a plug-in one depending on you know what I'm doing. If it's going to be long extended, I usually use the plugged in one. If it's a quick hit, then I'll use uh, the, the battery powered one. But I'll put that on it and just make it really flat so it looks good and it looks smooth. And then I'll take some some of the IPA alcohol that I use and I'll just wipe it across the top of it. Or if I had to hit a couple different spots, like sometimes I have to hit a couple different spots. Like for example, when I do this one, I will, I'll take a quick sander to the bottom of this see if you can see the texture here so you can kind of see the texture where the supports were i'll take a sander to the whole bottom of this piece i'll clip off this little piece and then um i'll likely take a sander to this just so it's smoother not too much just enough to make it smooth and so if i'm doing all that i'll probably dip this whole thing and actually wash it for a minute or two in the um in the actual like wash station that you have for 3d printing so um yeah let's go ahead and get this guy glued now one of the one of the my favorite things in the world to do i, I love this stuff i wish i would have discovered it like years and years and years ago i just started using it about a year year and a half ago when i started doing the tau diorama if you haven't seen the video um let me switch back over here. If you haven't seen the video of it, um, the Tau the Tau diorama, um, there's one down there like four steps to make an awesome diorama or whatever. I'll put a link on there if up here if I remember. Um, but during that one, I had a ton of pieces I had to assemble. Like there's just a bazillion pieces I had to assemble. And one of the things I did um, or found was to use accelerant and accelerant is awesome so you you basically what you do is you will spray the accelerant on one side of what you want to glue and then you put the glue on the other side and then you put it together and it is like instant 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 bond you get about a full second second and a half maybe if you're if you're lucky um it was longer than that then you probably use too much of one or another um usually too much glue if that's the case but you get about a second second and a half max and then it is bonded together like they say super instant glue it goes it glues together immediately yeah that's that's a lie you're holding the damn thing for like a minute for it to glue now is that quicker than like elmer's glue or or rubber cement or i don't know whatever other kinds of glues that are out there um liquid nails let's just go that way is it quicker than that yeah sure it is and it's fast compared to that um you know a turtle's slow compared to a rabbit and a turtle's probably faster than a snail so you know whatever i i need fast what i need fast so this is good to be able to do a whole lot of things because you just spray and then you put the you put the glue down on the other side put them together bam done like so that was a lifesaver during that project. It would have took me probably another hundred hours to assemble everything if I had to wait for the for the stinking glue to dry. Now I like the spray, but very quickly the spray stinks for a couple of reasons. One, I hated the spray because when you sprayed it, it went everywhere. I ended up having to wear gloves. It got everywhere. I felt like I was wasting half of it with that. And so I kind of invented this, or I don't know if invented is the right word. I invented it for myself. I didn't see it anywhere else at that time. I don't know if I have seen it anywhere else, but I use a little dropper bottle similar to what you do for like your paint. So kind of like an army painter type bottle. And I just fill this up with the accelerant and I don't even have to like squeeze or dab this on there. I basically just kind of outline. I just like outline the piece. I just like wherever I'm going, I just touch it and it automatically puts some on it. I have saved so much of this of this stuff and it's not incredibly expensive but doing like the huge project like the towel diorama i went through about a bottle and a half of this stuff versus when i did um 
you know, other couple projects, like when I did that giant display board for corn and I had to glue a ton of stuff together, I probably would have went through about the same amount of stuff. But with this, I barely used half of one of these little bottles and I can get like three bottles of these out of this. I think that math works out 60 milliliters. Yeah, actually four bottles because this is a, I get about 15 milliliters out of this and this is a 60 milliliter bottle. So I get four of these with one of these. I barely used a half one for a project that would have done it. So you save a lot of money with that for sure. And you don't get it everywhere. It's in all of your hands. I don't have to wear gloves now to do it because I'm not spraying and getting it all over my hands. It doesn't stink up the room because this stuff's kind of stinky if it's being sprayed all over constantly, um, which is not good. So, all right, I'm getting too distracted. I'm going to actually start assembling this thing. So we're going to do exactly that. Make sure you know exactly how it goes. Um, this is a really good one where, say, you got his foot here, but I could kind of put his foot like that. It would really suck if I glued it together and it looked like that. That's a really, that's a really goofy leg. Like, is he doing the splits or break dancing? It's just kind of weird. So, but yeah, lots of glue. We use lots of glue in this house for sure. So let's start with double check, make sure I'm not putting it on the wrong leg. See, it's going to do it the wrong way. That's why I test it. So I'm just going to put it straight on here, put a little bit of glue. I always end up using a little bit more. They tell you you can use a drop per, you know, square inch or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to put that on there. Sure, I line this up the right way. Bam. Done. Two, three seconds. God, I hope I put that on the right way. <laughs> Get nervous, right? <laughs> Get really nervous. Like, I've just got done giving everybody a speech about how they need to make sure they test fit in, blah, 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 and then I put it on the wrong way. That'd be embarrassing. So, are we going to do the same thing with this? Um, I don't really know if I really have any tips or any like things about what side to put the glue on. I try to make sure that if, you know, like if I had something that um, actually putting together those gates for the um, for the corn project, I really uh, made sure that I had. Yeah, see, like this thing's set already. Be careful because sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but when I was doing that one, um, and I had to put two pieces together, you know, so say I had like these two pieces I was putting together and there's a piece in the middle, I would pick which, like where am I going to put the the um, accelerant? Am I going to put it on the arms or am I going to put it on the middle piece? What I didn't want to do is put it on the arm in this one and then on the middle piece on this one because now it just starts getting weird. Um, I try to just pick one and stick with it for the most part because I don't want accelerant to bleed over into the glue side on the other thing, depending on how close it is. Because um, as soon as that accelerant hits, it starts curing up the glue. And if the glue's cured up, next thing you know, you can't put your pieces together. And that has happened and really sucked. And then you have to pull it apart and you got to scrape it and try to get it down. The, the bond doesn't work exactly the right way. It's just, it's just a whole lot of not cool, you know? And we don't want that to happen. How does this look? Okay, this is a little bit goofy. One of the things they do sometimes, they have these little pegs in here. And those little pegs don't let things sit the right way. Usually that means because the part got warped a little bit during printing. So it's kind of a good indicator that you done messed up. But sometimes it just fits weird or you don't like the fit. So I just take in, if I have to, sometimes I'll just take like a pair of snippers. You know, you get their snippers. You just cut that off and then you can set it any way you want. Just, if you do that, make sure that you key the thing to fit exactly the way, you know, you know exactly how you want to put it together. I've actually done it where I've, like a model like this. And I said, okay, I'm gonna, I know which way I'm gonna put it together and, and I'll have somebody help me and actually put the glue on one side and accelerate on the other 
so I make sure that I put my hands back together the exact right way. So sounds funny, but it works. It works. Uh, one of the other cool things that is neat is this little tiny thing. I know some people use like nail files and stuff, but I got this like little tiny um, stick thing where I can you do some very light, like just shaving down. And this is just for some little tiny nubs that I need to get off if I'm trying to do it. If I'm doing anything more than this, anything where there's any like real particles that are going up in the air, technically I should be wearing a mask, period. If, even if I'm just, you know, cutting it with a knife, you should too. Don't do stupid stuff like me. Um, but just like with this little bit here, like what I got, um, I can take and just like stand these little tiny bits down and then that makes this flatter and get a better bond. But I, I like using this. I get these from a friend who has them and I can go in and like, he brings me some every now and then. It's a nice guy, which I appreciate that. I usually keep a bottle of rubbing alcohol over here by me just so I can I can wipe this down because you don't want the sand or like a little bit of stuff from there to get in with the glue or the accelerant. That's not going to work. Oh, yeah. See, that's better. We're going to do the same thing on this set here. Um, yeah, so there, I've had a lot of weird things happen with scale lately. Um, you know, speaking of scale, I had a lot of weird things happen with a um, couple models in between their own thing. I went to print them and I, they're like, all our models are, you know, they're I'm trying to think exactly what it was. Let's just say they're a 28 millimeter scale, is what they said. And so then I actually took the model and arranged it, the unsupported model, and I arranged it in the in the slicer program and measured it. And it was the model itself, the way it way it measured out, it basically came out to that the model was like 45 millimeter scale right and i'm guessing and assuming how how tall the act the person is in real life but comparing it to the other models that are out there and i put another one that was right next to it and just lined it up it's like well this model even without sizing anything but just lining it up you know like basically lining it up like this on the you know like this but flat down lining it up like that with the pieces so i get the right height next to each other there was like a difference in height in these things it's like okay well maybe they're you know maybe that is meant to be that way and so they're like oh no they're both the same scale i'm like okay well that's kind of interesting but sure but it's like you just you just don't know so at the end of the day you really don't have to follow anything that anybody else tells you just print it the way you want it right? Just print it the way you want it. That's what I do sometimes. It's like, you know, I can't figure out the mysteries that they did. And I don't know if I really care to figure them out. I'm just going to do what's going to make sense. In a, the case of printing for a client, I'm just going to do, I'm going to talk it through with them. If it makes sense, you know, bring it to their attention. They're like, hey, you know, I'm printing this for you. Are you using it for, with D and D stuff? Are you using it with you know Warhammer or Conquest or whatever? Because you know I think if you put this next to other models, it's gonna look stupid, <laughs> you know. And most of the time, they appreciate it. They're like, "Yeah, you know what? You're right about that. That that makes perfect sense." So that makes sense, and I don't want it to be that way. So. You know, and then we make the little adjustments or tweaks or whatever. So, but I try to make them, at least if I'm selling stuff or giving stuff away or printing stuff for friends or whatever the deal might be, I'm at least following, following that. So, one of the things that I wish I would have done more as a, in the very beginning is I wish I would have uh, not assembled everything 
every time, like completely assembled everything. This is a really big problem for 40K for me. I was so excited to get the model and, and I wanted to build it so I could play a game or a match with it. And the problem ended up being where I just didn't, you know, I, I built it and then you go in, you're like, crap, I want to paint this model now. And it is a nightmare to paint. Absolute nightmare to paint. So um, I've kind of learned my lesson, but at the other other side of things, kind of not. Um, we just went to a tournament and I had an Angron model, which is like this giant like demon thing. Um, actually, he's right here. So let me grab him real quick. But, you know, like this giant, giant demon, it's got like wings and stuff. And this thing was just an absolute pain in the butt to paint because these wings here, how are you supposed to get in there to paint those things when it's assembled? So it's one of those things like you build it and you put it together, but you like have this arm separate, you have the wings, you don't put them on yet. And then maybe you don't have this arm on. Uh, I've seen some people do it with and without and all that. And other people I've seen, they haven't attached it to the base either. And it's like, oh, damn it, you know, it's already assembled. I was, like, so excited to be able to build the thing that I didn't think about the subassembly process that you need to have. So, um, so even now, but I think about it a lot more. So, for example, with this particular model, and I'm almost done here, with this particular model, um, I just want, I'm going to glue the character themselves together because when I look at the when I look at the character and I look at the different textures and stuff that are available for this character and the placement of the of how the weapons are and things like that it's going to be very 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 easy to get into the model and paint it right so take a peek at this, it's going to be very easy to get in and paint this model. Like there's, he's not holding the ax in front of his chest or something. And then you can't paint his, his chest or his clothes or whatever's going on there. Like you can very easily paint everything in this. So this is a very safe assembly in my opinion. Um, if I was doing this for myself, which I am, then I would assemble it to this level, right? Cause I kind of want the model to be big enough that I can move it and manipulate it around when I'm painting. And I'm not trying to paint some little tiny thing and like lose my mind or get, you know, cramps or carpal tunnel from it. Um, and so this one, this one works fine. This is perfect. Now, what I also am not going to do is I'm not going to glue it to the base just yet. I'm going to keep the base and the model separate. And that's going to be important because this is where I found out if I boogered something up. I did just a little bit, but we can fix it. This is why I should have tested it. Nobody's watching me do this, right? I don't have a recording I'm going to put on the internet. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Looked worse than I did. So I'm going to keep the model. I, I love this model. This thing looks awesome. I'm going to work on that painting it for myself. But very cool model. And I'm going to keep these separate until I'm completely done with painting this and painting the base and then I'll I'll glue it together at the very end because more than likely like on the base part I'll probably start with some type of like color or dry brushing or whatever but I also don't want to accidentally be fighting with the boots that he has fighting with the boots and fighting with this and maybe trying to get the little tiny pieces underneath there to make sure they like I'm just gonna let's do a separate so they look good but at the same time, consider, you know, the lighting and how it's going to hit and make sure I don't have lighting coming from this way on the model, but then lighting coming from this way on the ground, unless there really was a light source or something. So, I don't know. So, definitely a cool model. I like these. I got a couple more here that I'm going to work on. Let's see if we can get Leo built really quick before I stop ranting and raving for the night. So this one was a pretty easy print. Said so most of the time, most of the things were really good. Um, there's just some little bit of knife work. I'm gonna have to hit some of this stuff with a sander, but most of this. I'll switch back over to my overhead view here. But most of this stuff here is just like little tiny pieces, like like this. Like you can see that little tiny. 
I just need to get take that off. Works really well. Uh, like a knife, just quick knife knife work cleans that up. I want to be a little bit careful because what I don't want to do is cut into the model. Um, if I did, or if I found like a hole or a gap or something like that, and I'll show you what I mean about a gap, or I mean a hole. Um, and I, this has happened sometimes. Sometimes it's debris. But you can see there's like a little tiny hole in his head. Um, there's a couple ways you can fill this hole. Kind of depends on your mood, I guess you'd say. Um, for this particular one, I'll probably, because I know I'm going to use some type of, of filler for other things, I'll probably just fill this one when I do that. But you can use Milliput. Uh, this is one of the ones that I like to use is, is Milliput. Um, you can use green stuff. It works. I prefer Milliput. It's a little bit softer. Um, so I'll, I'll fill that in when I do it. I know I'm going to have stuff I need to do with these Ninja Turtles, and I hate wasting this stuff because you never can judge exactly how much you need. You either have not enough or too much, and then you end up wait, wasting it a little bit. But I do like having kind of a witness thing so I can tell if it's done or not, but usually you leave it overnight anyways, and it is always almost... I don't think it's ever not been dry overnight. If it's not dry overnight, your piece was way too big to begin with. Um, but yeah, I'll use a... I use that to fill this and just make sure that it's it's all good. But so using filler really really makes a big difference for things. Definitely something I need to do. I'm gonna have to hit this in some of the areas with a piece of sandpaper. I'll just have to kind of roughly go over it. Um, probably hard to tell here. I'm gonna see if I can see if I can zoom in enough on this, but. Basically, right in here, there's a bunch of like little. Um, if I had it painted, like if I had it like primed or whatever, but there's a bunch of like little bumps that are there from the from the supports, and you can't really see them a whole lot. But if you were to put your finger over them, and it doesn't feel natural with whatever the texture should be, doesn't matter. Who cares? I, well, I care. And two, this is going to. Um, this is going to a client, so I really don't want them to get a piece of crap, right? I know, um, I'm going to toot my own horn here for a second. I know some of the other 3D printers that are out there, um, it's hit or miss on Etsy, depending on what you're ordering and what you're getting. A lot of times what the other printers will do, uh, they'll print them up, they'll take the supports off. You know, the, the, Actually, I've, I've gotten some myself before I started 3D printing on my own. It's so one of the reasons I started 3D printing. But I actually got something like this in the box and said, here you go. And it's like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> right? Like, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, you know, as somebody that's not used to 3D printing, they're like, why? What do I do? They're like, oh, you just take the supports off. And they got instructions to tell you what to do. And they give you recommendations, you know, make sure you sand, make sure you whatever. It's like, well, like, dude. What did I need you for? You literally just put it on the printer and took it off and gave it to me. That sucks. And um, like at least pull the supports off or something. But whenever we do prints, this is where the, the horn tooting comes in. Um, whenever we do the prints, I take all of the prints off. I will clean up all of them. Make sure all the stuff's on. And then if it needs a quick sand, I will sand it and just do it if there's a little bit of filler that needs to happen because of the way it printed i'll put a little bit of filler in it and um and if depending on if they want me to assemble it or not because sometimes they want me to assemble it like something like this I'm like yeah yeah can you assemble it or whatever we'll be we offer that is a thing then if i assemble it i'll check the gaps and fill it in too that's part of the process so i think that's what you should get right if you go on to etsy if you go on to you know whatever third party you know, print site thing or wherever you go, you should get a 3D print that way. And, you know, I'm, I'll be the first to admit that we didn't always do that. We've really tried to step up our quality over the past like year or so, especially when we got real serious about 3D printing. Um, but the way this process worked is that we, we definitely want to make sure that we, we fill the gaps. We're making it happen. If there's a piece that's like really sensitive, you know, like, so I got Casey Jones here and he's got this hockey stick. Like this hockey stick could probably break. Let's say it was thinner. 
then I'm going to send probably two of these. And I would have done it when I printed it. I would have printed a couple. I would send them a couple and leave a note and say, hey, I put an extra one of these in there. Don't know. It's kind of sensitive. I, if it breaks accidentally, whatever, then now you got a spare in case you're assembling it or whatever. Like, here's an extra piece just in case. Because if I was building it, I'd feel uncomfortable. Like with that, I feel like I would break it. And then there's nothing worse than having to contact the guy that sent it to you and say, hey, you, my piece broke. Can you get me another one? And and then you got to wait a thousand years. By the time you get it, you lose motivation. You know, it's kind of the way that works. So, yeah, so I'm going to work on putting together the rest of these Ninja Turtles. Um, oh, one of the other projects I like I'm working on is uh, some 40k models I have some old um, chaos models these are b the possessed models here uh, these are just some old they got new ones and they look a little cooler but these are just some basic possessed uh, the old models bases I think were 32 inches or 28 inches I want to say they're 32 or I'm sorry 32 millimeters wide like actual millimeters that's not a scale that's an actual millimeter um, and so we wanted to make them legal quote unquote legal which basically meant printing up a 40 millimeter base. Um, I wanted to have one that looked kind of cool and fit with what we were doing. So I just have this like kind of neat base. So I'm going to be placing each of these on um, the base. So then they they look cool on the bases and then we can actually get these painted up. These have been sitting here because we bought them. And then I think in the end of ninth or the beginning of 10th edition, which is about a year and a half, uh, year and a half two years ago i don't know i lost track of time on that one but we actually um we actually took in couldn't use these because they weren't the right size i mean for our own games does it really matter probably not but if it was a, a game um, if it was a competitive game it would matter and at the time we wanted to actually take them in a competitive we wanted to take them to a competitive game this glue is totally not going to work. We're going to find out. Oh, nope, it did. Got an arm that popped off here. Um, we wanted to take him to a competitive game and do something with them, But I think we changed our mind at the last minute. But, yeah, so I like 3D printing for that aspect. I can supplement things. I can supplement bases. I can put extra things in. Um the stuff actually got some i've been going through you can't see it over here but we got our huge gaming table um one second say i should have used super glue i would have, would have glued together already with this glue you're literally melting the you're literally melting the plastic there we go should be good enough to hold um, so all the way like that way you can't really see it but I have a bunch of like three prints all lined up I'm gonna grab these really quick um, I'll show you so here's the here's the rest of the Ninja Turtle stuff so the rest of, oops the rest of the Ninja Turtle stuff so you get the other turtles I gotta work on cleaning all those up and get them out um, also got some Talus dreadnoughts uh, 3d printed I wanted to spam a couple in a list and have some fun and do some silly things with them so I spam those up I gotta clean them up I got three of them I need to do I'm probably gonna give one of them to a friend also have a couple more of those black forge game models so we got this really cool one I love this bear head this bear head is awesome and then also got this uh, this it's called a tension model it's basically like a like a demon kind of samurai thing looks really really cool uh the blade that's on this thing the weapon is massive so this is a sword and i just want to show you this in comparison to so this is the model here and all these are the same scale this is the sword that goes on that tension model that i was just talking about this thing is huge it's like almost as big as this guy's thing if you're a stormlight archive band um red way of the kings this is like a freaking shard blade for sure um i might print it up and do something with it if i were to do that but <laughs> it's pretty crazy so um 
But what I really wanted to show you here before I sign off for the thing is this is what we're working on. We're uh, my next army. So I just did. Let me change the view back over. So I we just got done with our corn, um, with our corn display board. But it was the whole table thing, and we did a video. I'll link it probably in here if I remember, whatever. Um, but you got this corn display board, huge thing, like four foot by five foot board, um, regulation size, like Warhammer size. Warhammer. I know regulation is 44 by 60 inches, whatever. Four foot by five foot. Don't slice four inches off. It's not a big deal. But um, so we made that. We made the terrain look really cool. We're going to be using it and playing it. But um, once a year, we just kind of do that. And then the next thing we do is we do like the, the we'll try to, I pick, one army each year and i try to make a cool display board i've been doing it for this is the third year i've done it um i start off with the cool sisters diorama and and i really like that it had stained glass window and everything it looked really cool i loved that thing um now looking back at it it's kind of a little bit cheesy and i could see where it looked a little noobish um but whatever but then we said okay we're gonna do better and we did the towel one um which i really loved and that thing just got so much attention people loved that tree and the way everything looked and and the colors and like the paint was like just really awesome and then we had um the corn one we just did so next year um and i'm, I'm starting to work on this now because i really really want the paint job to be spectacular on it and i need time to do it we're going to work on a tyranids one and it's going to be um kind of like a beach side ambush so i'm gonna have you know tyranids kind of like coming out of like a like a reef for the most part and you got like um space marines driving down the side of the road and they're going to be in their vehicles or whatever they're doing riding dreadnoughts i don't know I haven't quite figured out the logistics 100 percent, but they're going to be cruising down the road and the tyranids like are in mid like ambush attack kind of with them and it's so they're going to be like jumping out of the water um, they're going to be like ripping apart a, a, you know, a tank or something. I haven't figured out if it's going to be a tank or a dread or maybe like a like a centurion devastator or maybe like a, um, some like eradicators. I really like to kill some eradicators. I hate those freaking things. I love them playing with them. I hate playing against them when I got monsters and vehicles. They're a pain in the butt. Um, but just like ripping apart something. Or some things right it'd be really cool but i have these neat bases that i found um i think the name of the i think the name of the person that made them is the crippled god foundry i'm pretty sure that is who the, yeah that's exactly who this is crippled god foundry and it was the name of the um the the theme of this particular one that they did i think was like shark god or I want to say it's Shark God, something like that, whatever. Um, but they had these really neat bases that I thought fit perfect. Just want to find a couple that looked really neat. Um, yeah, this one here. This is one of the bigger bases, and it looks really cool. But check out that base. Um, this, and so it's got all the coral on it. It's got some neat... It's got some neat stuff. I am... So I'm planning... On taking these, I'll probably slice them just a little bit thinner if I can get away with it, and then glue them or size them appropriately to go on top of, um, to go on top of the existing Tyranid bases and use these. Now it's kind of, I don't want to say it's a lazy way to go with the bases, but it's kind of like the lazy way to go with it because I don't have to like mold and form all these. I am going to have to paint them to make them look cool. That's going to take a lot of time, but. Um, I could just kind of put these on. Now, historically, I've done something like I've done some type of like rubble or I've done like water or I've done like there's a whole bunch of these different things that I've done so far. Um, so this will be a little bit easier by comparison. Um, so I'm going to do that, but I'm also going to have people in various states. So there'll be some that are like on the side of the beach. I love the fact of no matter where the model is, that's exactly where I put um it's exactly what I make the base look like. I think that's just a cool thing to do. So I'll definitely be following that. I think it's just, it's a standard. If I'm making some type of display board or diorama, it's a standard. The model needs to match wherever it's standing kind of thing. So a little harder to do, a little bit harder to plan out, especially with army changing and 
you know you might want to move your people around or have them interact differently but um i think we're i'm going to try to do one of these like once a week i think um not promising it i'm not guaranteeing it the world's going to get crazy here depending on the season and with my you know day job and all that sometimes i get really busy and then i don't have time to do anything um but exist um maybe try to get some sleep sort of thing but if i can I'm going to try to do one of these once a week and just kind of talk about the things that I'm going through, some of the things we learned, and just make it a little more casual compared to, you know, yapping at you and instructing you and lecturing you and what you should do and, you know, being extra monotone when I'm explaining something. Um, but just be able to go through and kind of show you what we're working on, talk through some rantings and ravings. Uh, maybe be a little bit more productive because the only thing I really did is glue one of these things together. Um, so I'll work on that. But um, yeah, so we're going to try to do more of these and show you what's going on. And I think the next one we're going to do is going to be about like kind of planning and plotting out what that Tyranids diorama is going to look like. I've been collecting pictures. I've been looking some things up. I've been doing some research on how coral reefs line up with like that like how do they work compared to the road like the interactions that are happening the rule of cool is going to supersede all of it but i want it to be somewhat believable and not stupid um and i got some problems i need to solve with that one i just need to talk out loud about so anyways that'll be the one that we do next week um if assuming that we don't run out of time between now and then to be able to make it happen but um should be able to do it anyways thanks for hanging out um listen to my ramblings we i hope you are having a good time in your own adventure if you're working on a project put you know comment down below about that and uh until next time when we see you at the table